This is Radio Health Journal. I'm Nancy Benson. This week, nail biting. When does it go beyond just a bad habit? It's kind of crazy what nail biting can lead to. I mean, the list goes on. How nail biting can cause serious health problems when Radio Health Journal returns. I'm Reed Pence, the producer and host of Radio Health Journal. If you like listening to Radio Health Journal, you'll also like our sister show, Viewpoints, which covers a wide array of topics from education to history to the environment. Here's a preview of what they're covering this week on Viewpoints. Think about it for yourself. Think about a time that you were scared of something and someone told you, oh, that's nothing to worry about. Just calm down. Did that make you feel better? Probably not. We explore the art of how to successfully talk to children. Then... We see this plane race past us, and I watch the plane aim and crash into the World Trade Center. What were you doing the morning of September 11th, 2001? I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in-depth this week on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. Listen to Radio Health Journal and Viewpoints on your favorite radio station. And subscribe and listen anytime on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Also, follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Radio Health Journal. Most people have a bad habit or two. Many of them are established in childhood and are carried around throughout life. For example, a surprising number of people bite their nails, according to Dr. Dana Stern, assistant clinical professor of dermatology at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York. It's shockingly common. And in fact, when I first came across this statistic, I was surprised. It's about 20 to 30 percent of the general population. And this statistic may actually be low because we really think that the prevalence is likely underestimated because patients are often embarrassed to seek help for this condition. Just like any habit, nail biting occurs in varying degrees. Some people may just chew off hangnails. Others are chronic biters who tear at their cuticles and the skin around their nails, causing terrible damage. But why do we bite our nails in the first place? Dr. Fred Penzel says it may be linked to evolutionary grooming behaviors. Penzel is a psychologist and executive director of Western Suffolk Psychological Services in Huntington, New York. He focuses his work on habits he calls body-focused repetitive behaviors, like skin picking, hair pulling, and nail biting. All these things, as I say, have some relationship to grooming behaviors. However, they were never meant to go as far as they go when it becomes a disorder, basically. So all these things have their roots in evolution and early types of behaviors. They say all people do a certain amount of them, but for the majority of people, they don't become problematical or don't turn into disorders in their own right. But for people who bite beyond what's normal, their nails are visibly different. You basically tend to see an abnormal short, uneven nails. Oftentimes, the cuticles are affected. Biting can occur anywhere along the length of the nail. So the cuticle is the nail's protective seal at the base of the nail, and it's a very crucial anatomical structure. A person may have infections, they may have skin damage or, you know, nail bed damage, things like that, or uh, it causes scabs and bleeding and kind of unsightliness and causes social problems, you know, to the point where the person is keeping their hands behind their back or in their pockets when they're around other people because it creates like a sort of social embarrassment in addition to, you know, these medical and other problems. As Penzel says, infection is a major concern for extreme nail biters. The constant contact between the mouth and open wounds around the nails can lead to a variety of health problems, especially when the cuticle is damaged. The cuticle is essentially what prevents everything from entering the nail unit. And so lots of biters like to kind of pick and tear at that structure, and that can wreak havoc in a lot of ways. It can actually result in secondary infections, things called paronychias. And there are actually two types of paronychias. One is caused by yeast and one is caused by bacteria. And what is crucial to understand with respect to nail biting is that our oral flora, the kind of bacterial ecosystem in our mouth, so to speak, is 
kind of in a well-balanced state within our mouths. But when we stick our fingers in there, our nails will kind of take on organisms that are not supposed to be lingering and entering the nail unit. Nail biting can cause other injuries and damage to the nails as well. You can develop something called a splinter hemorrhage, which is these little black longitudinal streaks within the nail that are actually blood that collect in the grooves within the nail bed. And those are a direct result of trauma. Basically what's happening is the nail biter is essentially crushing the little capillaries and blood supply within the nail bed. And then the grooves within the nail bed fill with blood and it looks like a black splinter. You can also develop other abnormalities such as punctate leukonychia, which are white spots throughout the nail. Those are very common in children. Stern says it's even possible for someone with a history of oral herpes to transfer that to their nails. That's called herpetic whitlow. You'd think with all these complications, people would try hard to quit, but it's not that simple. You're trying to satisfy a need within your nervous system, which is pretty powerful. You know, it's like uh, there's usually, let's say, some mechanism that regulates levels of stimulation within the nervous system. And in this case, in these folks, it's not working very well. So it's very hard to resist. Your nervous system wants what it wants, basically. And nails are always there. So is hair and skin. They're always available. You can always use them for this purpose. Penzel says chronic nail biters seem to have no control over their biting. But resources, like a therapist, can help those who can't seem to break the habit. If it's serious enough, probably need to work with a specialist, you know, a therapist who's trained and has experience in treating disorders of this kind because, first of all, you need to do a very careful behavioral analysis of it to understand all the triggers and all the inputs that generally lead to a person doing this. And then you have to either eliminate those triggers or control them in some way or modify them or find substitutes. So it's, as I say, it's a very comprehensive kind of therapy, and you really need someone who has experience in doing this. You know, people may try one or two little uh, techniques that they've heard about, but it won't be enough to overcome a problem that's become quite serious and become very pervasive. Once people quit biting their nails, obviously it stops infection and further damage. But sometimes it may be too late. People who have been lifelong nail biters who are really biting down by the cuticle area, sometimes their nails are very wide and it's very hard to reverse that. Sometimes the nails will actually develop pigment from biting. The nail biter has kind of these black to brown to gray longitudinal streaks in the nail. And the reason that occurs is because the nail actually has melanocytes, which are the melanin producing cells. And typically they're kind of sleeping, they're dormant, but when they get stimulated and trauma is the number one stimulus in the nail of these melanocytes, they wake up and start producing pigment and it appears as these brown to black stripes. This sort of permanent damage is why it's important for people who are chronic biters to seek help to get over what's more than just a bad habit. You can find out more about all our guests on our website, radiohealthjournal.org. Our writer-producer this week is Morgan Kelly. Our studio producer is Jason Dickey. I'm Nancy Benson. Radio Health Journal returns in just a moment. Today's consumers are choosing foods for specific health benefits. Heart health tops the list, according to a recent study conducted by the International Food Information Council. Certain whole foods, such as grapes, which contain over 1,600 natural plant compounds, may be the key. Registered dietitian Courtney Romano is a health advisor for the California Table Grape Commission. A heart-healthy diet is rich in whole plant-based foods. A first step is to consume more vegetables and fruit, including grapes. Fresh grapes have hundreds of naturally occurring beneficial plant compounds, including antioxidants and other polyphenols. Research indicates that adding grapes to the diet every day helps support heart health in both men and women. Heart-healthy grapes from California are in season from May through January. Grapes of all colors, red, green, and black, are a natural source of beneficial antioxidants and other polyphenols, which contribute to heart health. Visit grapesfromcalifornia.com for more information. Colleges and universities are trying to return to normalcy this fall. But with students living and learning in close quarters again, and the Delta variant running rampant, 
the risk of exposure to COVID-19 is increasing. 18 to 24-year-olds have the lowest vaccination rate of all eligible age groups in the U.S., and most universities are not requiring students to be vaccinated. Erica Hirsch is Vice President and General Manager of Asymptomatic Testing Solutions at Thermo Fisher Scientific. Breakthrough infections among the vaccinated continue to occur, resulting in further viral spread and putting people at risk. This means that monitoring of community infection rates and frequent testing of all students, regardless of their vaccination status or expression of symptoms, will be imperative in providing proactive responses to any potential outbreaks at colleges and universities. Some prominent universities in the U.S. are already mandating regular testing of all students. Find out more at thermofisher.com slash COVID testing for college. And that's Radio Health Journal for this week. Radio Health Journal is a production of MediaTrax Communications. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more. And check Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify for a library of past programs. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and information about our guests at RadioHealthJournal.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Radio Health Journal. Coming up next week on Radio Health Journal. The horse is out of the barn once the information's been breached. So there's not a lot you can do. Like you can't change your name or you can't change your medical history or anything like that. Making your health care data more secure. Because if it's breached, it's already too late. Then why are preventable heart attacks often not prevented? Over 75% of people got the question wrong, what causes a heart attack? Most thought that it's just about cholesterol. All that and more on Radio Health Journal.